right, so we're ready. So good morning, good morning once again. Um, on the show today, we have a very important guest. His name is Dr. Um, Oyedeji. Tayo is his first name. He is the MD and CEO of Publicist Group, a marketing communications company that is number one in Sub-Hara Africa. I, I dare say number one in Africa. You know, but he's also the co-founder of a fintech called Overwood, based in Texas, but has special focus on emerging markets. And their aim is to bring savings products to everyone at a high yield. You know, usually you don't get um, very high interest rates on your savings account, but Overwood looks to change all of that. Interestingly, he's also a graduate of University of Illinois with a BSc in economics. He has an MBA from K Oxford, Oxford University, and also a doctorate from the University of Minnesota in Columbia. I'm, I hope I'm right. <laughs> okay, great, great. So it's great to have you on the show with us today. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Okay, great. So just, just to give you a bit of a background, um, my podcast focuses on um, interviewing people doing what they love for a living. And um, the reason why that's the aim and that's the focus is because um, I found out that many people have passions that they're not pursuing and they're unable to because, mm -hmm. as you know, in order to, you, you first have to have money before you can say you're pursuing a passion. And not, most times people um, are not lucky enough to um, be able to do the two at the same time. Very few people have found their passion very early and have been able to pursue it as a means of livelihood. So my aim is to document um, examples of people that have been able to to achieve this in whichever way they they have either they started from their passion and were able to skyrocket from there or they had to work a bit and do it as a side hustle or they worked for a bit and then eventually transitioned out of paid employment maybe to what they really love to do and you tick all the boxes for all the examples that i want to share so it's it's great again to have you on the show as I had told you before, I'm, I'm, I'm a very passionate follower of yours on Twitter. And you have over 120,000 people following you. So it's, it's, it's great, you know. And I remember one of your tweets that I saw back uh, in 2019. You were trying to explain um, how you built wealth. And you were explaining the myths regarding working hard versus working smart versus working strategically. You know, so I was wondering if you could give us um, an insight to this, describing the myths and describing the strategy that you have used to build wealth for yourself. Thank you so much. Thank, first of all, thank you for having me. I think um, I love I love how enthusiastic you are about what you're doing. I love the passion. I love the I love your smile also. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So my view is that um, people need to understand that hard work is necessary to be successful but hard work is not enough right so um if you ever go by a construction site you find that the people that work in construction are probably the hardest working people you'll ever meet they yeah. they literally give everything their time their energy their effort and they work really really hard but you find that they extract just a small percentage of the value in the construction industry value chain right and so the question to ask is if you want to extract more value from what you do then you also need to be strategic that means asking questions around um, and a friend of mine says that um, you shouldn't just find the gap in the markets but also find the market and the gap right so if you find a gap that has no market then you're going to make a loss in many ways right so it's about finding a, a job that you love to do but that is also well aligned with what people want because people pay for what they want and what they need, right? So if, if, you, if you're very passionate about something that people can't, don't want to pay for, you may work as hard as you want, but you're never going to be financially successful. So it's about finding the, the, the intersection between what you love to do, between what you do well, the things you're willing to work hard at, and then most importantly, the things that have the potential for, for profit. So that I think is yeah. where is the sweet spot that all of us need to pursue, right? So hard work yeah. is important, I agree, but you also need to be strategic with your hard work. Yeah, and, and how did you 
how did you work strategically in your own life in building wealth? I remember part of the tweet, it was a long thread, and you were explaining how you, um, you aimed for a master's first. No, you wanted to do a doctorate, but you thought you would not be able to get a um, sponsor for your doctorate. So you went into doing your master's first, you know, so just explain a little bit about your journey, just so as my listeners can have a background as to how you got to where you, you got to. So I actually started in banking. Um, I was I was in um, a bank called Citizens Bank back in the day. I remember. <laughs> yes. And then from there, I, I actually found my passion for communications and media. Right. But um, I wasn't sure I was going to pay my bills. But then I met a couple of people that were doing very well in that industry. And so they offered me a job and I left banking to pursue that. Um, but when I was pursuing it, I'd actually studied mechanical engineering for my first degree. I thought it would be great to get some further education in that space, right? So um, I applied, first of all, for an MBA, and nobody would give me a scholarship. Um, there was literally nobody that was willing to pay for my full life. But my scores were really good, regardless, but I couldn't get a scholarship. So I thought, well, why don't you find a way to go study something else and see if you get a scholarship, and then eventually you can then do an MBA. So, at first, I went to America on a master's for a master's in mass communication on a full scholarship, right? I got my PhD in the same field, and then much later, after working a bit, I then went back to Oxford for my MBA, right? So, actually, I have two master's degree <laughs> one, in wow. the, one in the UK. But the point of it was that if I had kept banging my head, I must get an MBA, I must get an MBA then nothing was going to happen. So strategy also, part of strategy is deciding that this is where I want to go, but the way there may not be straightforward. I may have to take a bit of a detour, but eventually it gets me to where I want to go. So what I tell African, African people, especially kids, is have a goal, work hard towards it, but be, be flexible on your way towards that goal. And um, I think all things are possible if, you, if, you, if you're strategic and wise. Great. Okay. So looking at your profile, you worked in divergent industries, like yes. the industries you work in, they're like <laughs> night and day. <laughs> you know, you, you worked in finance and then you moved to um, marketing and communications, you know, and, and, and it's great because it gives people that are listening an example of how, that it, is, it isn't impossible to change drastically your field but how do you how do you how do you advise people to go about that say they're working in a job or a field that they don't like but they're there because i mean they have people that they that depend on them they must ache out a living how do they move from from what where they are to where they want to be you know my my view is that people should first meet their needs right um some of some of that people will tell you follow your passion follow your passion well that's basically an American thing. Because in America, if you follow your passion, hunger will never kill you. There's, there's food stamp. There's... <laughs> yeah. They, they have social security, yes. Exactly. In our part of the world, if you follow your passion, there's no food there. You will you'll be dead before the passion comes alive, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so my view is we need to pursue the things that would help us live the day to day, right? Yeah. And then after we're successful in meeting, you know, Maslow's are key of needs. They're still basic needs, you know, food, clothing, yeah. shelter, the things that will keep you alive, right? After you've been able to meet some of those needs, then you can start with your passion on the side, right? Eventually, your passion could grow to the place where it can feed you and meet your needs before you transition fully. That's, that's always the way I think people should consider it. Um, on our yeah. continent, the needs are, are big, and the governments don't help you meet them, right? So yeah. you kind of have to be strategic to make sure that you don't die while following your passion. Yeah, right, right. And, you know, speaking of passions and side hustles, I know you're an advocate for um, finding a side hustle while you pursue your nine to five or some other thing that is giving you um, revenues for a living, you know. But also in our part of the world, employers don't encourage side hustles, you know. There's some companies that, you, you cannot be even heard of, it cannot even be heard of that you have, you are doing something other than 
the nine to five that they paid, paid you for, even though you are not um, encroaching on company time. So for people like that, what do you advise them to do? I say your nights and weekends are very valuable. Yeah. Your nights and weekends are very, very valuable. I think, I think for most people, you only build wealth at nights and on weekends, right? So during your weekday, I'll say, give your full attention to your current job give your employers your very best. But when people get home at seven o'clock, so when people go and watch football, right? If you choose that instead of watching football, I'm going to study artificial intelligence, for instance. Why is that bad? Or I'm going to build a business that sells clothes. Why is that anybody's business, right? So what I'm finding out is, I think we've been, we've been recruiting for some senior people in our business. And a lot of them will tell you, oh, by the way, I also have a fashion line. I just thought you guys wow. should know before we finish this interview so that because I'll still continue with my fashion line, but it will not affect my job. And I think I've hired about three people that have told me things like that. There's a, there's a lady that... You are a red sells, breed. <laughs> there's a lady that sells jewelry. Um, and she's... Abs I mean, the jewelry is absolutely beautiful, but she does her job very, very well during the day. And whatever she chooses to do with that, with the rest of her life, it's none of my business. So I, I, I think people pay you for 40 hours or at worst, yeah. maybe 60 hours. You can do whatever you want to do. That's my belief, my strong belief with the rest of it. And the problem is that most people do nothing with it, right? And I find that fascinating that most people just go home and sleep and you know just chill and party and and i just it's just it's just amusing to me because my view is that on our continent the only way you build wealth to a large extent is when you're willing to do beyond what everybody else is doing yeah i remember a comment you made on twitter sorry i'm i'm always referring to twitter because that's where i follow you the most you know and you were you were talking about your ai mentor and you said he was a music composer but yes. he he's a ai mentor to you too and i, I and i remember you saying once that you learned how to code as yes. well you know so and that for if you're trying to build wealth using um your skill then it pays for you to be technical you know, and technology is the way of the world now. So, but but not everybody is inclined to technology. Like, I'm highly analytical, but I'm not very technical, for instance. So, how, how do you suggest people um, upskill, especially in technology, if they are not necessarily technical? I don't think everybody needs to be technical. Some of the best businesses in this world are what you call sweat equity businesses, right? There's a gentleman... That, that you, I think he used to be a consultant at, um, at Accenture, and now he's built probably Nigeria's largest food business, The Place. Everybody knows The Place, but the guy yeah, I remember was a I consultant, know. right? So it, it means nothing. There's a, there's, a, there's a restaurant chain in London right now. It's called Enish, right? So they've got one in... Oh, the, oh, you should check it out. E-N-I-S-H, Enish, yeah. So they've got one... I will. In, on um, on Oxford Circus, they've got they've got they've, in a bunch of other places. I think they have about six or seven across London. But it's Nigerian food and it's fine dining, right? But wow. this guy went to school in England, got his first degree, tried to work in the bank, everything. But now he sells food, and he's making so you could tell he's making so much money, right? I think my brother and I went there and just to eat it was almost a hundred pounds. Think about that for both of us, right? In, in for both England. of you or just one person? Both of us. But still, you know, if you bring okay. it to Naira, how much is that? A hundred pounds, that's almost a hundred K, right? Just a, a yes. big meal, you know? So, and he's, make, he's just making so much money, right? And there are people, like this girl that I was talking about, um, she works with us, but she has a jewelry line. So what she does is, I think she goes to Cote d'Ivoire or somewhere and buys... I don't know where she goes, but she buys like all this jewelry and she basically just okay. puts like a 2000 naira markup on it and she sells it online, right? And so all she does is she takes pretty pictures. She's the, she's the model. She takes pretty pictures with the jewelry okay. and she sells at a 2000 naira premium and she's making really good money. 
Um, and so it's not about technology alone. There are multiple ways that people can use to, to build significant um, income across our continent. But for everybody else, I'll say that technology is extremely important if you're technical, especially artificial intelligence in today's world. It's, 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 I think we're just at the beginning. In 10 years, every single thing we do will be different because of artificial intelligence. Okay, so my um, next question would be regarding um, what you speak about the most. I hear you talk about side hustles and investments, but not so much on debt. I don't know if it's my perception or it's actually true, but I wanted to ask you, what do you think, your, what do you think the role of debt is in creating wealth? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a strong advocate against debt, right? I, wow. I, I believe okay. that debt gets people in trouble very often. <clears throat> and I think most people should try to live within their means, right? Um, like I've, in recent times, a couple of our employees have got into really, really big trouble and I've had to bail some of them out because debt is now so easy, right? Um, people are literally calling you, they're emailing you, asking you to come and take a loan. And if you're not disciplined, you, you and those loans are usually high interest loans, right? So if you're not disciplined, you 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 take a million naira and in a year you pay back three million or two point five million. You know what I'm saying? So my view is that people need to be really, really yeah. careful, right? Um watch the interest rates, watch every single line item on the debt you're taking. If you absolutely have to take it, if you absolutely have to take a loan. Um, be really, really careful to make sure that it's something that is not going to destroy your finance in the future. I, I really, really think people need to be careful around around loans and debts. Do you agree? Okay, and I and I have I have a different opinion completely. <laughs> tell me, tell me. Your because you know, if if you are trying, to... okay. So I'm an advocate for debt, especially because. Um, if you're trying to buy an asset that is capital intensive, you might not have all the money at a go. That's one. The opportunity to invest sometimes is fleeting. You know, you might need to seize the opportunity in the moment of the opportunity, you know. And for me, even savings is, I tell people, is it, for me, it was a bit redundant, as in I'm saving, I'm saving when I can buy an asset now, you know. I'd rather take a loan and buy an asset so that I enjoy the capital gains that I can I can derive right now, you know, and then pay back the loan over time. In a way, I'm saving money in the reverse because because I've taken a, a loan from a financial institution, I'm obligated to set aside money compulsorily every month to pay back the loan, you know, as opposed to savings where if I say I'm saving, but I find someone in need, do I say I don't have the money when I do? because it's actually in a savings account, you know, but if, if I'm paying back a loan, I can genuinely say I don't have because I know I need to pay back the loan, you know. I've even done a video on it because I'm a strong advocate. You said? Give me an example of the assets you, you propose that you're talking about. Okay, like like houses, for instance, or like um, buying um, equity, a, a public offer, for instance. Like if you were trying to invest in the MTN, um issue that happened some years ago now and you didn't have money it, it was an opportunity with the deadline you know um buying a house is not something most people can do from their paid um the salaries for instance you know so those kind of capital projects how do you how do you finance them if you don't take a loan it's nice to have a cash cow as a business and not need extra money but or buying a car Oh, but buy, buying a car is not an asset. A, a car is a liability, but it's capital intensive too, I agree. But um, for me, um, for a car, I, I could even still take a loan. I could make an exception and take a loan for a car. In fact, I did once. I took a loan for a car. And I was glad I did because um, about four years afterwards, they, the government put a ban on importing cars. So the car, price of cars skyrocketed, even secondhand cars. You know, so just imagine if I hadn't taken the loan then to buy a car and it was a new car. So it's it 
I'm still using it up to now, nine years afterwards, you know, so it was, it, it wasn't an asset, but it was a fantastic decision, especially as, as it relates to what happened in Nigeria regarding the banning of um, importation of cars or increasing the tax on imported cars rather. So my, my view is that um, I think you're very disciplined and so you don't get in, in, in trouble with loans, right? Um, but I think it's tough to generalize from you to the rest of the world. Uh, most people take the loans and, and they end up paying back over a really long period. And after a while, it becomes an albatross on their neck, especially in a country where the interests are very, very high, right? So let's, let's assume that you take a loan, you know, even they do it on a monthly basis and they sell you it's 3% per month or 4% per month, usually 4% per month, right? If you take a million naira, yeah. in a year you pay back 1.5 million, right? Um, the question is that's that's almost 50% of the of the of the loan. How many businesses or assets generate 50% in a year? Do you see what I'm saying? How many? Not many, right? And so yeah. what ends up happen, happening is that I've seen people, like this gentleman that I'm helping with his trouble right now, he actually borrowed to start a business. He borrowed to buy a printing press, right? And now the printing press is working, the business is live, but the loan is literally killing him because everything he makes from the press, he puts towards servicing the loan and it's still not enough. So the question is not absolutely don't get a loan, but if you absolutely have to and you're buying an asset, you sort of need to be really, really careful with the interest rates and the other terms on the on the on the loan. My my preference is to like I haven't apart from mortgage, I haven't taken a loan in over 20 years. In over 20 years of working. Just because when I need to buy a car, I buy the car I can afford. When I need to buy food, I buy the food I can afford. When I need to pay rent, I pay, I get the rent at the place that I can afford. And then you just find out that your life is a lot simpler. You're not, nobody's chasing you around, right? Um, there's a scripture that says that the, the borrower is a slave. A servant, the lender. And I found that that is more true, more often than not. But reasonable people can disagree. I think you have a, you have some really strong points. People can borrow to buy assets, but my my prefer what I've seen is that people are not disciplined. They're not like you, right? So I typically just say, just live within your means and you'll be all right. Okay, I, I will <laughs> agree to disagree with you. <laughs> but but I will say I will, I will say one one more thing on the on the on the point of um of um, debt. Usually, I don't advocate to, to, to pay the debt for the life of the facility. It's, for me, a, a loan is a short-term gap because I know the longer the tenor of the loan, the more you are servicing the interest, which most people don't know. So usually, when I want to take a loan, I will, I will look at the contract. You know, if there's some penalties for prepayment, for instance, I will negotiate that one downwards because my aim is to pay back before the loan actually uh, reaches its maturity, you know, just to um, kind of balance the effect of interest payments. But you know, but that's, 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 look, uh, at the, look at what you, you just said. You just showed that you're very, very financially savvy, right? 99% of the people that are listening to you can't do the calculation you just did. Do you understand what I'm saying? So because you're very financially yeah. savvy and you know how to manage money, and you're wise with your finance, it doesn't put you in trouble. But what I found is that when the more people than not get in trouble, and they were looking for ways to bail them out, so to blah, blah, you know what I'm saying? But I think I think you do have some good points, you know, assets that you can afford that will bring you more money. For instance, I would never take a loan to buy equity. Why? Because equity is not, 100% guaranteed, right? Um, it's good. <laughs> it could always go down and the loan is constant. Yeah. It goes up, right? While the equity can okay. go up with it or come down, 
and now the gap between what you collected and what you have will be, um, you know, but, you know, reasonable people can disagree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I get you, I get you, and I respect your points as well, yes, you, you, you're making a lot of sense. Okay, let, let me move us away a bit from, from the issue of debt. You, you have a, a principle, the one thing principle. Yes. I discovered it last year. And I, I tried it this year, but I, I'm sorry, I feel that it's... <laughs> I really feel that it... I, you know what I was trying to do? I, I have, I've been working on two things since last year. Learning a, a foreign language and building my social media presence. You know, so when I discovered your video, I tried it this year, but both things are so important to me and so important to where I want to be in future. So I struggled with it because if... For instance, learning a language, you know, it's in the consistency. You have to immerse yourself. If you stop for a period of time, it's like starting all over again when you try yeah. to pick it up again. Same thing with social media. If you are not consistent in posting, eventually people will leave because they're not getting enough from you. And then when you do resurface, it's like starting all over again. So I wanted to ask you, are there any exceptions to this principle? Okay. This one thing principle? I'm not sure, but let me let me let me just tell you the way I think about this, right? So, okay, your one thing is what led you to the two things that you're doing, right? So maybe your one thing is to become what's the language you're learning? French. French, yes. So maybe your one thing is to become the the social media expert that brings French and English people together. I'm giving that as an example, right? That brings because mm -hmm. that, that would be a big niche. So if, for instance, you're the person that can speak to both Francophone and Anglophone Africa with social media, I'm giving that as an example. So that could be your one thing. Yeah. Now for that one thing to happen, you have to build social media and you have to build French language competencies. Do you see what I'm saying? So I think yeah. your, the one thing you can't you can't have it at the bottom level, it's gotta be a bit higher. You know, so but it needs okay. to be higher. There may now be different strands of things that you need to do to achieve that big picture, right? So um, it can be either learn on language or build social media, right? The question you need to ask is: Is there one thing that both of those things are are leading you towards, right? So I'll give you an example. My goal in life. It's sad because I haven't even me that I teach you principle. I haven't. Um, I haven't really, really given that much this particular, um, at least this year, because I've been so busy with other things. But my goal in life is to make what I call systemic difference in the lives of a lot of people. So to help a lot of people move their lives forward in many ways, right? So part of it, to achieve that goal, I need to be well-educated. I need to have some finance, because that helps yeah. in other parts of the world. I need to be, to have a voice, right? So it's still one goal, it's not changing. So I chose to have a voice in social media because it leads me to that goal, right? I chose to build businesses because it leads me towards that one thing, right? I chose to, I, where I am right now, to help people consciously because once again, it leads me towards that goal. So I feel like it's not, um, it's not the goal is usually big, and then there will be different strands of things that lead towards it. So both social media and French are both important and good. <laughs> and they may lead you towards where you want to go. Okay, thank you for clarifying. <laughs> <laughs> because I was struggling. I was like, ah. <laughs> does that mean I want to be a jack of all trades? No, no, but, but I understand your point. I understand your point completely. Okay. So I, I was going to ask you something else. I remember you recommending a book called Half Time, you know, and, and the book is subtitled um, Achieving Significance After Success, something like that, you know. And I, I was really interested in the book, but it the book sub presupposes that you were successful earlier on in your life, it's like if in your 40s. You have, yeah, it's not for everyone. Yes, exactly. So... So, so my question would even be that, say you, you are talking to someone that is late 30s, 40s, 50s, and the person really, really um, wants to achieve something in life but hasn't been able to so far. 
you know, and, and maybe the person feels that time is running out or they're late, you know, what, what kind of advice would you give? I won't advise them. I'll tell them a story. <laughs> okay. So Go ahead. My, my mom was a primary school headmistress in a school called Oshupa Baptist Day School, Ogomosha. <laughs> That's where I'm from. You're from Ogomosha? No way. <laughs> I find. Yeah. <laughs> Where's your high five? Come on, I can't see it. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. Yes, yes. So, now think about it. She was that too in her 50s, right? I think she was 54, 56, right? Um, doing that. And then one day she said she was going to leave and go start a business. And I think she was about 55 when right? she started her business for the first wow. time. Wow. Yes. Um, was she was going to build a school because that's her area of expertise, right? And and she built that school. Today, they got like huge expanse of land. They got a primary school, a nursery school, a secondary school, and all that started wow. in her fifties, in her late fifties. Wow. She's eighty six now, right? So it's been thirty one wow. years of consistently building that school. But all of us would have had to drop out of school if she hadn't done that in her 50s. Because a few years after yeah. she started, my father died, right? And my father was the CFO, the one that had all the money, was the one that was taking care of everything. And my mom was just a school teacher that was just, you know, um, doing education because that's what she liked. When my father died, three of us were in university, myself, my younger brother, and my elder sister. And if my mom had not started her business in her late 50s, one of us or two of us would have had to drop out of university because all the funds in the house dried up apart from the one that came for her business. So it's never too late. It's, um, it's the, as long as there's life and health, there are lots of opportunities that someone can still pursue. Okay, great. All right, that's that's really inspiring. Even even for me, not like I've attained financial freedom yet, too, but but it's good to know that you know there's still there's still hope. Yeah. Okay. So I want I wanted to ask you. I noticed that um you, your Instagram handle is Doctor Tayo, and most of the articles I've seen written about you either addresses you as Doctor Tayo or puts the PhD at the end. So I wanted to ask you, is, is that deliberate? Are you deliberately um, emphasizing your doctorate degree? Does that help your brand and in, then, in the end your business? And how important is it for a person, whether in paid employment or as an entrepreneur, to have a personal brand? I think it's important, but I'm not very good at building a personal brand, to be sincere with you. I, I, I am I'm quite understated and you know as Nigerians we tend to be more I can't and loud and you know, so if the people that talk about personal brands in Nigeria will speak to you, they'll say I, I, I haven't built a strong personal brand. But you know, I, I I hope to do more in the future. But I think it's important because people talk to you based on what they think you can do and how 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 they think about you. You know, but what kind of brand do you want to build is also important, right? So I think I, I find it interesting that when people talk to me, they think, oh, this guy sounds really smart, right? So I'd rather push that it says intellectual than this guy has 500 Mercedes Benz, he lives in Nicoya, this is that, he goes to London every week, blah, that stuff, you know? So I... I find that I'm a little different from most Nigerians in that regard. I don't want to be with the social media. That's why I hardly ever do anything on Instagram, right? Because Instagram is all about showing the pictures of you in Amsterdam today, this one tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. I'd rather, <laughs> I'd rather compete in the marketplace of ideas than the marketplace of swag. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I'm going to, I'm going to borrow that um, slogan from you. <laughs> I'm making a hashtag. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. So um, I, I remember also that you you had said something, and all these all these things you have, I keep them as in I re, I retweet them, and it, it, the retweet is selfish because it's not like I'm trying to spread the message, but I'm trying to keep it so that I can refer to. You know, it's easier to find something you retweeted, but but that's by the way. I, I remember something you said about um execution that it's easy to have ideas but it's very difficult to execute mm. you know so can you give us an idea of how how it how best it is to to develop the skill of execution mm. i think that um how do you develop the skill I, I i'm not sure but i know that it's extremely important right so everybody <laughs> Here's an example I like to give. So when I went abroad for my master's, I had a friend, um, I won't mention his name just in case he sees this. But we were supposed to do it <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> and this guy is a medical is a medical doctor. He went to England to do his master's for 10 straight years just with his mouth. For 10 years. Oh, I'm leaving, I'm 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 blind, blah blah blah. blah, blah. And so it was all strategic and talk, but no action. So the way I see execution is more about action, right? Like you need to do it, then do it. Um, you, you want to you want to build you want to build a hairdressing salon, then go do it. Don't just talk it, right? And I think it's easier to talk, and we tend to talk a lot as a people, but when it comes to doing, sometimes we do fall behind. So my view is that the doing is actually more important than the talking. That's what I mean by execution. Okay. And okay. we are now right. great Got ideas. It. Right? That's my view. There are so many great ideas. Um, but it's the person that does it that actually gets the results. Yeah. 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 You're right. Okay. So I, I want to delve a little bit into the businesses you're involved in, at least the ones that I, I know of. So talking about Overwood, um, it's a fintech, meaning that I'm assuming it means that there's no brick and mortar um, building like traditional banks would have, you know, but it's based in Texas. So so how does that operate? Is your market Nigerians or, or people in the, from the emerging market in Texas or your customer base is actually in Nigeria? So I think Overwood is is overwood.ng so you find out that for nigeria it's overwood.ng built for nigerians specifically right so when we move okay. to um to maybe rwanda because rwanda is the next market we're looking at will be overwood.rw okay. you know what i'm saying so there'll be specific models yeah. built for each country that that we consider right uh, i'm one of the co-founders of overwood yeah. and one of the things that we try to do is to democratize investments think about it for most people for you to invest the funds that you have you must um build it up a little bit you know maybe it's a hundred thousand naira or something and, and go to invest you know what i'm saying but what happens when all you have is 50k yeah. right or all you have is 10k or whatever you know what i'm saying so you sort of what overwood yeah. does is it gives people an opportunity to invest regardless of how much they have right and for the people that have quite a, a few, a, a lot of money, it gives them a safe place to keep their money from the madness of the world, right? Like, I even tell people that there are some things that, because why would it's, it's focused on safety first, right? So it's focused on yeah. making sure that people's money is safe. Because you've got all this, you know, everybody, this uh, Forex, this crypto, this, that, 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 that. Yeah. Trying to double your money quickly, but can also lose a lot of your money. So Overwood doesn't do any of that stuff, right? So we look for really safe investment that ensures that whatever you put into Overwood comes back to you without any problem. You know what I'm saying? So it's safety first. Yeah. So over the past three years that Overwood has been in operation, we've been able to um, to work with a little more than 50, a little, almost 20,000 people and um to build quite a lot quite a bit of money in terms of money that's been invested in in, in the fund in, in the things that in the investment vehicles that we have and so i'm very very proud of the people that work there i don't so I, I i personally have built the system 
from the day to day of it so that it's a, it's a really robust system. And I'm really, really proud of the work that's getting done. I'm proud of the people whose lives are getting changed because now instead of spending all their money, they're able to put a bit of it aside for, for the future. That makes me really, really happy. Okay. So I wanted to ask because I was curious. You know, usually in Nigeria, institutions, microfinance institutions, for instance, they need some sort of license to be able to take deposits. But is it does it help that you're based in Texas not to need a license to no, operate no, in Nigeria, Nigeria or you? We have a... We have okay, a, what kind of license? Finance license. So... Um, okay, right. That's the right. full finance house licensed by Sydney um, to operate okay. in, in that space, right? So we have a license, a Nigerian license. Okay. We're looking for a Rwanda okay. license. We get a Kenya license. So any market we move into, we'll make sure that it's fully licensed. Okay, great. Markets. Okay. Okay, and are the depositors' funds are they insured? Um, yes, they they are actually matched against um against shareholder shareholders' funds to a large extent. You get what I'm saying? Right. So whatever happens, we're able to. Okay. Like, the, the, I'm very very grateful for one thing: we've never defaulted once, not once, and it will never happen. Everybody that's put money in the world has been able to get their money back right on time. As, as needed without any problem. Right? So, um, and that's the plan. Like I said, we're not building for today. We're building for a hundred years. That's the plan. And over would be there in a hundred years. Yeah. Okay. I, I think you, you actually mentioned somewhere that you, you were not trying to um, make profit in your first few years. No, no, no. We haven't made your it, focus was different. At all. We haven't made profit in three years. Right? The focus is on. Wow. Is, is that sustainable? Oh, no, but we will make profits very soon. We just wanted to build the model first. The model has been tested and proven now. So we're, we're, we're actually working on, 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 on becoming more of a profit center this year. So it's, um, it's, not, it's not a forever model that you will not make profits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. And, and I was looking at the website and I noticed that you can use your card to pay or to um, deposit money into your Overwood account for USD. But I didn't see that option for, for Naira. Is, is that exists. deliberate? Is it difficult? Yeah, the option exists for Okay, it does. Okay. okay, okay, great, great, great. So let me tell you a story. Okay. One of the first people that invested in Overwood was my mom, right? Wow. <laughs> So, no, but she's biased. You're her, biased. you're her son. But yes, of course, of course. But she never told me, right? So one of the things wow. she never told us. One of the things that happens at Overwood is that um, we we call everybody on their birthdays. Every single person that has an investment at Overwood, we, we, we don't send text messages. We call basically, and people that have a certain threshold of funds. I personally used to call them, you know, you know. So that day I got a list of people to call. And on that list, I saw Mrs. Oedeji. And I saw the number. And I was like, this woman. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's so sweet. That is so sweet. So I called her. And I said, hello. She said, ah, Taya Bauni. I said, no, this is not Taya. This is... um." Dr. Tayo Yedeji from Overwood. I'm calling to wish you a happy birthday. Thank you for trusting us with your phone. <laughs> We're really, really proud that you do business. It was like, Tayo, stop joking. And he said, no, so thank you very much. <laughs> Goodbye, Ma. I oh, just wanted to wish you well. <laughs> and then I dropped the phone. And then later I, I called her. She was like, Tayo, what was that? I was like, ah, Mommy, I just said I should greet you. This is Tayo now. <laughs> Oh, that's so sweet. Yes. That is so sweet. Uh, uh, up, up, mommy. Yes. That is yes. fantastic. <laughs> oh, great. That, that, that's such a lovely story. And I was curious about the, the, the dollar aspect because you guarantee that if the person wants to withdraw dollars, they, they can. And I, when I saw that, I was, I was really excited because, you know, in Nigeria, there's, there's an, there's a, I mean, liquidity in foreign currency is not elastic, you know. So I just wondered how you're able to achieve that, so, especially if the person didn't deposit 
in dollars. So the day we receive the Naira equivalent, we change it to dollars immediately and keep it in dollars wow. until you're ready to collect your money. Right. But you also okay. get, you get an interest on the dollars. I think it's about 3.5% on the dollars. So, which is most banks do about 1% or 1.2 or something. But yeah, so you get quite a bit of interest on the dollars. And then, and then I think it's after a year that you get your dollar. If, if you withdraw before a year, you get Naira. If you withdraw after you've kept the funds there for a year, you get your, your dollar back. And you know, just last week, somebody withdrew oh. $2,000, 2000 something. People have withdrawn $10,000 and they get their dollars without wow. any, any question. We've, we, we, we try to operate with integrity. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's extremely important that, that you do what you yeah. say and that yeah. you, you're very deliberate about doing the right things for the people. Um, because there's more to life than profit. That's what I'm finding in, in my life on a constant basis. There's, there's, yeah. there's the value of, of, of being a good person, the value of giving back to your community, the value of helping people yeah. become better than they currently are. And those things are probably even more important to me than just making money. For instance, the next yeah. stage in my life. Very, now, very true. You didn't even ask about that, yeah. but I'll tell you what I'm hoping to do. I'm hoping to build a bunch of um, hospitals that I hope will be free um, to people. Because I know that in our nation, people still die from lack of access to malaria drugs. And as you well know, malaria drugs are about maybe 2,000 Naira. 2,000 Naira is $3. So certain people die in our country because they can't afford three dollars worth of drugs and i think it's a shame i, I think that should never happen yeah. right so i'm hoping to within the next few um next few weeks or so to next few months work with certain friends and people to to start a, a true free medical basic medical care um hospital that would that would you know god help me i think that would be really important in the things that i want to do that, that's really laudable Ma, and, and i i think it's it's a huge problem to tackle especially as it's not really just about medicine as in the drugs itself but also about um the the um what's the word the doctors, the nurses, as you know, a lot of them are leaving Nigeria. Yeah. So, um, I don't. I hope that's in your plan to to attract all your Nigerians in direct Nigerian friends in the diaspora back yeah. to Nigeria. That that one is. It will be the next stage where we invite a lot of medical doctors back, mostly for surgeries and interventions, right? Because they have sophisticated yeah. skills that that can help in that regard. But you know that's in the future. For me, what I'm passionate about right now is 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 basic feeding, helping people get good food, but beyond the good food, helping me basic um, medical care. So if you need specialist med medical care, we won't be able to provide it. We'll refer you to a prop to a big hospital. Okay. But if it's primary care, you have malaria, okay. you have typhoid, you have you know some of those basic dysentery, you have cholera, you have the basic things that. An antibiotics can take care of, an antifungal can take care of. You know, I think I don't think people should die for things like that. I think it's a it's a shame that in our country people still die over five dollars worth of for things that five dollars worth of medicine can take care of. It's a big shame. Yeah. Now you've made yeah. me to I, I and I think there's a like, there's a lot of sorry, say, say that again, I didn't hear. I said, now you're making my thoughts. I didn't hear the last thing you said. <laughs> no, no, but it's it's good to um, it's good that we we ponder about these things. Really, honestly, there was there was a time that I, when when the IDP camps were fully occupied and there was a lot of things going on in the north, it was one of the things that I was passionate about as well. As in, you know, because it's easy for you to be stuck in your own world. You know, as long as you're okay, you believe. That's all that matters. When there are a lot of people 
that are in dear need, you know, and can't afford even the basic things that we take for granted. So it's mm-hmm. it's laudable. I, I know that there are, there are a lot of um, DFI funds that would support um, things like that, you know. So if um, if you're ever interested, I can take you up if I if I find um, that kind of funding that might help if you if you do need it. Um, but but it's it's great, it's it's great, you know. So um, I also wanted to ask you a few things about um, publicist group, especially regarding um, Amazon Prime. I remember when you announced that you had gotten the Amazon Prime account. I was like, wow, that's that's fantastic, you know. But but I'm still I'm still I'm still um, more more inclined to Netflix than Amazon Prime. I don't know if that's just me or it's something you've yeah, seen in Nigeria. <laughs> you, but, but, but you know you know I, i'm being honest and i i, I maybe i'm biased so I, i'm asking you the question now that is amazon prime now more popular than netflix because you see when i when i when i want to know about new movies i just open instagram and maybe it's because of who i follow you know so i i see um ebony life for instance when they're about to launch a movie the publicity is out i see it on instagram i i see the actors even you know, release clips of the movie, you know. But for Amazon Prime movies, I, I see it show up on my feed and on YouTube. But maybe because the actors are not people that I know, it, it's never it's never prompted me to go and watch the movie. And and I might be biased, biased as well because I'm more inclined to, I used to be more inclined to American movies than Nigerian. So, but I, I wanted to know, I mean, for a mm-hmm. fact, what, um, what it is. Yeah, Amazon Prime is new in the market relative to Netflix, but it's growing very, mm. very fast. And I think people are saying that the value in Amazon Prime is um is immense. It's absolutely great. Um, I'm I'm personally more more of an Amazon Prime person than a Netflix person because I find that the shows are better. They are they are better produced. So there's a lot of really. If you'll excuse my language, there's a lot of nonsense on Netflix, right? A lot of you know, bad scripts. You know, there's some good things, right? But yeah. I feel like Amazon Prime, literally everything you see there is good quality. So you're not struggling mm-hmm. to say, should I watch this or should I not? Because you know that literally everything you see there is really good. We're really proud of... Um, of, of th- there's a show coming up soon, called uh, a movie called Gangs of Lagos. It's 100% on Amazon Prime. And everybody that says it has just been like, this is absolutely wonderful. Yeah, so. Okay, and how did you get the account? Did it help that the company you represent is international, or that you had worked in an international company like Starcoms? How easy was it to get the account? It was just we we did really good work for them. To be sincere, for the like when I think about the work we did on on that pitch, it was very very good quality. So I think um, we didn't know them. We didn't know anybody, which I like. I like I like going in businesses where. It's not because someone is your brother or your cousin or you know somebody from somewhere. Yeah. We had never met them before. And so it was just the good work that spoke for us and helped us win it. Okay. And was it the same? You, you enjoy the same level of um, ease with um, Burger King? Because, you know, those are my two brands. So I have <laughs> to ask you about Burger King. Yeah, we work for Burger King for a bit. We work for Pepsi. We work for Heineken. Yeah. We work for Visa. We work for Coca Oats. Mm-hmm. We work for um, for uh, for Keystone Bank, and just I mean just a bunch of different um, firms that we're able to provide value for. And I think that the the key thing about us is just our professionalism. I think that's what that's what helps us. We we put everything aside and give hundred percent to our clients at um, Inside Publicis and across Publicis Network. Because I'm the CEO of the group, actually, Publicis Group, which contain, which consists of six businesses in Nigeria. Uh, so Inside Publicis is the one that people know. But we also have Leo Bonnet. We have um, Media Perspective Starcom. We have All Season Zenith. We have Quadrant MSL. And we have Digital. So six different businesses in different aspects of um, advertising coming together as publicist group is that we provide value to our clients. We also have Nestle. We and how? Love Nestle. Okay, go on. Yeah. Go on, yeah. Okay. 
Okay, I was going to ask how 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 different are all of them? As in, you list, listed about six sub -com companies within the group. Yes. Well, why 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 so many? Especially if their functions are around advertising. Yeah, there are different aspects of advertising, right? So we've got two creative agencies, that's Insight and Neoponet. We have two media buying agencies, and that's Starcom and Zenith. Then we've got a PR agency, that's Quadrant, MSL. And then we have a digital advertising agency, Digitas. And all of them compete in different aspects of, of advertising against other firms and against, against themselves. All right. Okay. And, and I have to ask this question because you're into the media. What makes good content? I, I ask because, you know, sometimes you, you see a comedian post one skit and you have two million views. And then someone is giving good good information and then you only gets a hundred views, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> so what makes good content? I, I also, also, apart from you being into media, you have, you're influencing over a hundred thousand people on Twitter, you know, and I know you did, probably didn't start out trying to build followership. It was more of trying to share your wealth of knowledge, you know, but just from your experience, what more makes good content? Yeah, um, I think it's it's about meeting people's needs, basically. Um, so the comedian is meeting a need for entertainment, and it seems like a lot of people have a need for entertainment. So that's why they want. <laughs> <laughs> you are meeting a need for information, right? And it seems to me like not as many people want information as do entertainment, right? But information has a higher value than entertainment, right? So, for instance, you you're, you'll probably be more likely to attract um, advertising from an investment firm, from a bank, from people that have higher values in terms of how much they're able to put behind you than a comedian would or should be able to. So, but again, it's 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 a niche it's a niche product in that there are certain people that want to move their lives forward. They will listen to you instead of Sabidos, right? <laughs> but there are also a lot of people that don't care. They just want to have fun, you know. Yeah. And there are more people in that space than the people that want to move forward. So that's that's what's yeah. responsible for for a lot of the differences you see. Okay, good. Okay, I'm rounding up. I'm rounding up. So my second to the last question, I wanted to ask you that. So in your in your, should I say, time on, on earth now, what would you think is the greatest lesson you have learned so far? Greatest lesson? Yes. <laughs> no No pressure. No pressure. I'll, I'll tell you a couple of really important lessons that I've learned and then see if it, if it qualifies as greatest. I think the biggest one is that anything is possible if you believe and are willing to work hard for it. Um, I think what holds us back a lot of time is because we don't even believe it's possible. Right? Um, let, let me give an example. So that's why we need information. We need the things that you're doing now. Right? Because information is what causes us to think higher than where we are. You know? So why did I apply for a master's abroad, for instance? There was a gentleman that used to sit beside me in Citizens Bank. His name was Demola. And one day, Demola came to the office and said, I'm resigning. And I'm like, which bank are you going to? And he said, no, I'm going to America. I'm like, Kilo Lodge, what are you going to do there? How did you, because I knew his parents weren't wealthy. And back in our days, only people from really wealthy homes went abroad for anything. So that piece of information yeah. and sincerely literally changed the trajectory of my life. Right? Because I just said if Demola can do it, then I can't. Right. So I just basically walked through the things he did. And that led to a lot of other things. Right. So but if you don't pursue the information that makes you believe things are possible, then to a large extent you're not going to 
to, to do much. That, that's, 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 that's the first big lesson. Anything is possible as long as you believe and you're willing to work hard. Anything. That may be the greatest lesson. Okay. Okay. That, that's fantastic. So my last um, question, I usually save this for last, but I, I always ask my guests to refer one person that I can interview to the podcast because um, I'm trying to build um, a database, of course, for people to be able to listen to and glean from and, and find an example to follow in their own path to doing what they love for a living. So I'll be reaching out afterwards uh, for yeah. a referral from you for someone I can interview. I hope I hope you won't mind. No, not a problem. I, I can even tell you who it is right now. I think you talked to Shukobi Plumtai. I don't know if you spoke to her. No, 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 I haven't. She is absolutely fabulous okay. and she she does really good finance training and she gets finance at a really high level. Okay. Ah, okay. I'll be reaching out for our contact after after the show. Okay. But in the interim, I want to say a big thank you for taking the time to speak with me. You know, just just as a just as a side gist, do you know how many people I DM, how many subscriptions I've made on LinkedIn trying to reach people? That I don't know for an interview, you know, and they hardly ever respond, you know, very few respond, but but you did, and I'm I'm so um grateful, grateful that you took this time to talk to me. So thank you again. It's thank been you. a pleasure. Thank you very much. It was a really was really good talking to you. Okay.